Good afternoon. I was very excited when I discovered that the Greeks named science philosophias, the lover of wisdom, because that's who seeks guidance in human affairs by studying nature. And it was exciting to me because that was exactly why I had gotten into science, only I didn't know the ancient Greeks were agreeing with me. So I very early in life started asking questions about who we are and how we got that way and where we can go from here. And as an evolution biologist, I was able to be a deep pastist in order to be a good futurist because only by seeing the past can you tell where you might be able to go, possibly. Now, we have been taught in our lifetimes a secular creation story in which science tells us that our universe is decaying and life is a fierce struggle in scarcity. Now, I think that's the most depressing creation story any culture ever thought up. And in Darwin's case, it came from Malthus, whom you heard about earlier today, Thomas Malthus, who assayed the resources of the planet and decided humans always outstrip their food supply, so we better get what we can while we can. And this is Darwin's own words. It is the doctrine of Malthus applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. Most people aren't aware of that. So we came to believe that fierce competition is human nature. And this story, of course, gave us a world economy that we built by liquidating the Earth's assets. And what was our job? They were driven by consumptions and so demanded that we shop. And we have shopped. We have shopped the natural resources and the finished products, and we are now in the sixth global extinction biologically. It is the first one caused by one species. In my own lifetime, the population of Earth has tripled. And that hockey stick curve going up there parallels the use of oil as the main source of our energy in the world. So some of us are now living quite well in this economy, and others don't live so well. Far more don't live so well as live really well. And we've put more and more of ourselves in these boxes which Prince Charles pointed out in his wonderful new book, Harmony, which I highly recommend, like factory-farmed chickens. Even our high-tech agriculture, which was meant to feed the world, is instead causing diseases and deserts. It is losing more soil than it produces food. Now, if you could stand on the moon and look for evidence of human life on the planet over time, what you would see is that humans are a desert-making species. That's our biological claim to fame. What do you think aliens would think of our species? Would they consider us intelligent if they were paying attention to us? What kind of creatures destroy their planets? Not too smart. Our fuels are polluting our skies, they're polluting our bodies, they're causing climate change. Just this year, on February 2nd, we had one storm covering two-thirds of the United States, and that was, of course, courtesy of polar ice evaporation. What evaporates at the North Pole comes down a little further south. The Himalayas are covered in snow, so is Canada. And on the same day, we had the largest cyclone ever to hit Australia. At the, also last year, Russia was burning and the Amazon had become a carbon emitter rather than a carbon sink because over a billion trees died not from being cut, but from dying of drought. So carbon sink to carbon emitter, emitting more carbon than all of the United States. This is very serious, people, and we are experiencing a popcorn effect with these things. The day before yesterday, we had one volcano and three earthquakes. It's getting, you know how popcorn goes. Why do these crises leave us in such denial? And I've asked myself that a lot, and I think we're afraid of ourselves. We really don't want to face what's happening. We would rather pretend that things are still okay. Not to panic, 
deny is better, and shop, as I said. We shop. Now, what I think we need is a more inspiring story about ourselves so that we can get away from this depression. And that is why I am calling my talk Celebrating Crisis and talking about what nature can teach us. Whole word didn't quite get there. <laughs> what can nature teach us that helps us get to a better future? Now, what if there were more to the story than the story we've been told? What if evolution is an intelligent improvisational dance? Many scientists now believe that the universe is alive and that its intelligent process is the self-creating living systems of our universe. These scientists, including myself, now see the Earth as being just as alive as the creatures of Earth. It's a very different view. Life is too intelligent to proceed one accident at a time. There's more to this story. After every global extinction, we have had many new species, whole new ecosystems developing at once, not slow, single Darwinian lineages, but something like nature saying, that didn't work, let's do something else, and working in a big way. Because nature conserves the things that work well and is radically creative when things don't work. She doesn't make you spend a whole lifetime being a conservative or a radical. She says, do what's appropriate. Protect what's good and what isn't working, fix it, save it, change it. Capitalists and communists disagreed. Science is always being politicized anyway. And the Darwinian competition story appealed to capitalists, but the Soviet Union was teaching Kropotkin, whose main book was called Mutual Aid and was about cooperation. Now, I'm going to show you that nature does both of these. These are, these are half-system ideas that really need to be put together. So how does nature do both of these? How do we have both competition and cooperation? What I see is an evolution cycle that starts always with some kind of a unity, say the homogenized minerals of the Earth's crust, which then packages itself into individual bacteria. So you have individuation from the unity, and when you have individuation, you tend to get tensions and conflicts among the different self-interests that arise. Now that is the Darwinian part of the cycle. So it is real. But when there are many more species developing, and you can't elbow them all out of the way, then some negotiations start to happen between different species or different individuals in the same species, and you get some kind of resolutions to some kind of conflicts, and in the best case scenarios, you not only develop real cooperation, but you build a new unity at a larger size level. This is where the big steps in evolution come in. So I'll show you how today's ecologists see the different ecosystems of our planet, You've got type one ecosystems which behave in a very Darwinian way, scarfing all the resources they can get, hogging territory, multiplying as fast as possible, competing with each other. I would call this uh, a, a juvenile mode, the first part of the maturation cycle. A type three ecosystem is not Darwinian, but Kropotkinian. The species are sharing territory, they're sharing the resources, they're feeding each other, and they're being much more cooperative. These are the rainforests and the coral reefs and the prairies and things like that. I saw a maturation cycle here. I don't know why it isn't obvious, except that Western science doesn't permit nature to be intelligent, so how can it learn? So here's the story, my happier story of evolution, and you have the background for it now. And I sometimes call it bacteria are us. And you'll see why in a moment. The early Earth was populated only by bacteria, and they called them archaebacteria for a while now. They're called just archaea. And this is two billion years. It's half of the life of Earth, where you had only those bacteria causing worldwide crises of hunger and pollution, solving them by harnessing solar energy when they ran out of food to make food, 
Then that polluted the atmosphere with oxygen, which comes from photosynthesis, so they invented breathing and the electric motor to use the oxygen productively. They created the first worldwide web of DNA information trade. All bacteria do this still today. And they evolved a huge cooperative cell when they finally matured. Yes, all that by bacteria without benefit of brain. So here's the little bacterium, and here's the big cooperative cell. We call it the nucleated cell. And it should be drawn a thousand times bigger than the bacterium because that just wouldn't fit on the slide very well. But the most important thing I'm saying to you today is that creative cooperation is the mature way in evolution. It's been demonstrated over and over and over. It is cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them. Then you don't have enemies. You can cooperate and do new things. Now, the big nucleated cells were now the new species on the planet. So they had a feisty competitive youth of another billion years. Bacteria are still living with them. And eventually, they go through the maturation cycle and form multi-celled creatures, larger cooperatives, again. And that, of course, that experiment is uh, part of uh, our own history, very much so. We're a big brain experiment, and the results are not yet in. Because we humans traded the inner knowing, what we call instincts, the inner rules that tell you how to find mates and how to govern yourself and all those things, acquire territory as necessary without killing each other, for big-brained freedom of choice. That's our distinction. We have to decide how to govern ourselves, how to live sustainably on this planet, as part of this planet. So we have now survived a dozen ice ages, and I hope you've all seen or will see soon Herzog's new film, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, about humans in the Ice Age who must have had a very beautiful relationship with animals. We had about 100,000 years, in fact, of cooperative communities. Naked two-leggeds would never have survived in forests full of bison and mammoths and lions and rhinoceroses and things like that if they didn't learn to cooperate, not only with each other, but with other species. And then we developed 6,000 years of empire building, which put us back in the immature mode again. So in the immature mode, the empire building humanity is now having to go through globalization, and I think this is a point of our maturation. It is time for us now to be a desert greening species. Fortunately, it's not expensive to green difficult, uh, deserts. It's not difficult or expensive, and that's why big corporations aren't doing it. It's not really highly profitable, but it would make us survive a whole lot better. And since we have to adapt now to life in a hotter age, and we have all the technologies to do it, why not do it? Solutions abound. You saw some of them today. And uh, remember, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones, and we don't have to wait to run out of oil before we end the Oil Age. We have already, and this happened very quickly, a trillion dollars of green business investments. It's coming along fast. We know that organic agriculture is not only healthy and restores the soils and the water tables and makes jobs, but that it outperforms high-tech agriculture. It is more productive as well as being healthier and more sustainable. A real science of economics has to study nature to find wisdom in human affairs. It's got to be based on nature's mature systems, not the immature Darwinian version. So I'm going to give you the best example and one that each of you have. You walk around in it all day, you sleep in it at night. It's your own body, and it has 50 to 100 trillion cells cooperating in amazing ways, and each of them is as complex as a large human city. One cell, like a large human city, small systems are not necessarily simpler than large ones, as you know if you understand anything about fractals. In fact, in every cell in your body, 
There are approximately 30,000 recycling centers working 24-7 to keep your proteins healthy, making new proteins out of the old, the old and the obsolete. Every one of your cells has approximately 1,000 banks giving out free stored value debit cards for you to spend into the economy because money is there to catalyze the transactions of an economy. It is not there to make money from money. So they never have to be repaid. When you've spent it, you go back to the bank, they refill it. Bank's job is just to control the amount of currency in circulation to prevent both inflation and deflation and have sustainable economies. We too can do this. Money should be a medium ex of exchange. It should not be a commodity. So before the money system collapses, do the local currencies wherever you can. Keep the money in your local community as much as possible. Do as much self-sufficiency as you can. In your body, there is self-interest in every molecule, cell, organ, organ system. And so you have negotiations and compromises being made among the levels to drive a win-win system. It's as if you have the whole evolution maturation curve in every moment of time. A poem from Hafiz about how nature does economics. Even after all this time, the sun never once says to the earth, Earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. Isn't that beautiful? Young people on the internet today don't show much interest in racism, war, greed, things of that kind. In a single generation, they can create a new world. And you're seeing peaceful revolution for the first time in a long time, non-ideological peaceful revolution about a better life. Even in Spain two days ago, the peaceful protesters in Madrid and everywhere, all around the Mediterranean now. So let me end with a little story I made up back when I was living in Greece and wondering why the Minoans had the technology of writing as a new technology and never wrote their stories or songs. And I imagined the young techies and the older people sitting around a round table and the young techies saying, we've got to put our stories into this new technology. People will know us in a, in a thousand years. They'll know our stories. And the old people say, you want to do what? You want to reduce our stories and songs to chicken scratches on clay? Your technology is not adequate to the problem. There's no feeling, there's no color. Fast forward to today. What are young people doing, texting all day? Many of you are doing this. With the first alphabet in history about feelings, emotions, emoticons, strip down the verbal language, add in the feelings, and what happens? Non-locally, you are resonating to each other with the same emotions, and this builds bridges across minds, and I believe will bring back telepathy, which is a human birthright, was practiced in many indigenous cultures. And telepathy equals transparency, which you heard about earlier. Look what's happening in the culture. First, we had transparency coming out in the corporate world, and then in the church. And now, in governments, transparency is on the agenda. Embrace transparency. Can we become homo sapiens sapiens? I believe it's our evolutionary mandate to create sustainable global economics and truly become a global family now. One more line of one more poem. Rumi, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? And there are as many ways to make a better world as there are creative people to do it. So do what makes your heart sing to bring about a better world for all. Thank you.